Hello everybody and welcome to this case-based workshop. My name is Dr. Michael Nell and I'm a medical doctor here in Cape Town, South Africa. Thank you for joining me in this workshop. The way I've planned it is that I've chosen five separate cases, each of which I feel have a tip or a trick to teach you how to localize lesions within the lungs. Now for the most part, these cases are going to be diagnostic images. There's not much interventional radiology. I'm going to try and sprinkle in some anatomy and one or two cases that have an interventional slant. Now it's my hope that by the end of this talk, you've picked up one or two tidbits that help you more confidently localize where a lesion is. Often it's easy to see which zone a lesion is within the chest, but it's quite difficult to know whether that's a parenchymal lesion itself, whether it's a pleural lesion that's extending into the thorax, or whether it's like a mediastinal or a hyalur lesion. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a bit more confidence when looking at these things. So I've chosen five cases. Each case I'm going to have on the screen for a minute. And in that minute, I'd encourage you to actually verbalize where you think that lesion is. The lesions aren't going to be difficult to spot. They're going to be large lesions. If there's someone sitting next to you, maybe you can confirm with them where you think they are. Place your bets, and then we will get into the case. I'll go through the case with you. So without further ado, let's get into case one. So hopefully that was enough time for you to go and place your bets on where exactly you think this lesion is. Now the lesion itself is not difficult to spot. We've got this large rounded opacity in the right middle zone here. Now whenever I have a lesion in this region, my first thought is, is this a hyalur lesion? Is it hyalur or is the mass in front or behind the hilum? Now I'm going to go through some hyalur anatomy. One, because many people find the hyalur quite difficult anatomically to figure out in their heads. And two, because if you're an interventional radiologist and you want to coil some pulmonary AVMs, then you need to know pulmonary vasculature like the back of your hand. So the hilum itself is made up of the bronchi as well as the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. So let's start by highlighting the bronchi here. The first thing I like to do is find the carina, find where your trachea separates into two, into your left main and your right main bronchus. Then we're going to be looking at the right hand side today because this lesion is on the right hand side. And the first thing you want to do from there is find your right upper lobe bronchus. Then we can follow that extension of the right main bronchus down as the bronchus intermedius. Then what we can do is try and find the pulmonary artery. Now the pulmonary artery is coming, or the pulmonary trunk is coming from the right ventricle. And we know that the right ventricle is on the anterior portion of the chest here. It sits behind the sternum. And then it extends backwards as the pulmonary trunk, and that pulmonary trunk divides into two, the left and the right pulmonary trunk. So our left pulmonary artery is heading that way. Our right pulmonary artery is heading anterior to this right main bronchus before extending into the right lung. Those great vessels are in front of our bronchi. So we've got our aortic knuckle here, and then our AP window, our aortopulmonary window. That marks where the level of the pulmonary trunk is. So I've said that the pulmonary trunk extends upwards, the left pulmonary artery goes over this left main bronchus and wraps behind it. The right pulmonary artery extends in front of the right main bronchus here. The first branch that's given off is our truncus anterior. And then the right pulmonary artery extends onwards as the right interlobar artery here. And you can see that right interlobar artery extending downwards. And that gives off multiple branches, branches to the right middle lobe. It also gives off medial basal branches down here. But the inferior angle of our right hilum is made up of this right interlobar artery. So this here is the inferior angle of the right hilum. Now the last vessel that we need to know about in the right hilum is 
this vessel coming down here. It's a little bit difficult to see on the scan, and I'm well aware that when this is projected on a screen where you're watching, some of it's a bit more difficult to see. This vessel makes up the superior limb or the superior angle of our right hilar angle. And this is our right superior pulmonary vein. It's posterior to these structures here, heading down towards our left atrium here. Our left atrium is a posterior structure. It gets blood from our superior and the inferior pulmonary veins. So this superior right pulmonary vein extends down in towards the left atrium here. So this is our right island. This is the anatomy we need to know. And it's sometimes easier to see on a CT scan when we can scroll through that 3D anatomy. So let me bring up a CT scan and show you these structures. So here we have an axial CT of the chest. We've got the mediastinal windows. And as I scroll down into the heart, we can see our right ventricle is this anterior structure here. As that right ventricle extends upwards, it becomes the pulmonary trunk. You see how it's extending superiorly and posteriorly before dividing into our right and our left pulmonary arteries. So our right pulmonary artery comes anterior to this right main bronchus, as we saw, and it actually runs posterior to our SVC. Now in my head, I always think of that right pulmonary artery as coming anterior to that SVC. So it's a good reminder that this right pulmonary artery is posterior to the superior vena cava. Now as that right pulmonary artery extends outwards, it then goes down next to our bronchus intermedius here. Now it's better to see that on coronal views. Let's look at the pulmonary trunk coming upwards, dividing into our right and left pulmonary arteries. This right pulmonary artery crosses the bronchus intermedius and heads down as the right interlobar artery. And we can see that right interlobar artery here. So we've got right pulmonary artery, truncus anterior, and right interlobar artery there. Now this is why you can see this interlobar artery really well on a chest x-ray, because we've got a hollow bronchus intermedius and we've got air-filled lung here flanking that right interlobar artery. So it becomes really prominent on a chest x-ray and that is a good landmark to look for in your right hilum. Now we had that right superior pulmonary vein heading towards our left atrium. So let's look here. Here we can see the superior right pulmonary vein. We can follow that up into the lung and then we can follow it back down into the left atrium here. You see how that runs behind those structures there and it makes the superior limb of that right hilar angle. So there's that superior right pulmonary vein and our right interlobar artery making up that right hilum. Now why have I spent so long looking at this anatomy? Because if you can see any of these hilar structures behind that mass, if we haven't lost the silhouette of those structures, we can confidently say that that mass is not sitting within the hilum. So let's go back to our chest x-ray and see if we can see those structures. So we can see when I was going through the hilar anatomy on the x-ray, we could clearly see that right interlobar artery. And in fact, we can see those medial basal arteries that have come off this right interlobar artery. We can also see vessels extending out to other regions from this right interlobar artery. And we can see all of these through this mass. So we can quite confidently say that this mass is not sitting within the hilum. So now we need to decide, is this mass an anterior mediastinal mass or is it sitting in the posterior thorax? Now, there are two main landmarks in the posterior thorax that I look to see if they have been obliterated. The first is this line that you can see here. This is our azygoesophageal line. Now, as the azygous vein and the esophagus head down towards piercing the diaphragm, it makes this line, and this whole region here is what's known as the azygoesophageal recess. It's a part of that right lung that is wrapping posterior to the heart. And if this mass was within this posterior aspect, within the azygoesophageal recess, we would lose the silhouette here of this azygoesophageal line. The second line that I look for is the paraspinal line. As we follow the edge of the spine here, we should have a nice clear line all the way through. If this mass was abutting the side here, then we would get a bulging out of this right paraspinal line. We wouldn't be able to follow that line clearly down. So it doesn't look like this mass is coming from the posterior thorax. If it is coming from the posterior thorax here, we think about hematomas. In trauma, often there's blood filling there, or neurogenic tumors, or infection like TB and a cold abscess in that posterior part of the thorax. So now we've excluded the hilum, and it's less likely to be a posterior mass. Just based on probability, it's less likely to be a posterior mass. More likely to be an anterior mediastinal mass. Now, if we want to confirm that this is an anterior mediastinal mass, there are two things we can do. 
we can take a lateral chest x-ray or we could have cross-sectional imaging. So let's have a look at the lateral here. And now clearly on the lateral we can see this anterior mediastinal mass here. Now often when the mass is posterior it's a little bit more difficult to see because these vertebral bodies are obscuring the mass. So we really need to look carefully if we're looking for a mass here in the posterior aspect. Let's have a look at the MRI that was taken of this patient. Now this is an axial T1 MRI of the chest. We can see our mass here extending into the pericardial fat. Now it's a T1 image, so our fat here is bright. Our mass looks like the same intensity as fat, and we can see that it makes an obtuse angle with the pericardium here. It looks like that mass is coming from that pericardial fat pad. And if we wanted to confirm whether this was in fact fat, we could do a fat saturated sequence. And if this went dark, we would confirm that this in fact is fat. Now we've also got a T2 weighted scan here, and I just wanted to show you the differences between a T1 and a T2 scan. We often know how to tell the differences in the brain, but when it gets to the thorax, it's a little bit more difficult. So generally in a T2, the fat is still hyper intense to the muscle, but it doesn't have that same that it does in a T1 scan. The next thing we can do is look at the vertebral canal. We can see that this spinal cord here is surrounded by hypo-intense fluid. Now fluid is either dark because it's a T1 sequence or it's a T2 weighted sequence where fluid has been attenuated, a flare sequence. Now when we're looking at the brain, our gray matter is on the outside of our white matter tracks. And when you're looking for a T1 scan in the brain, the gray matter should be darker than the white matter. The same thing happens here. But in our spinal cord, the gray matter is on the center of the spinal cord and the white matter tracks are on the periphery. So here we can see that it's lighter on the periphery and it's got a dark central core. The gray matter is dark, the white matter is bright. This is a T1 weighted image. We look at our T2 image, we've got bright fluid and then we've got a light central core, lighter gray matter and darker white matter. We can confidently say that this is a T2 weighted image. So what we've got here is a fatty anterior mediastinal mass, and by far and away the most common diagnosis here, or the most common differential, will be a lipoma. It could be its malignant cousin of a lipoma, the liposarcoma, and when we think of sarcomas, we're thinking of mesenchymal cell origin, connective tissue cancers. We have soft tissue sarcomas like a liposarcoma, and we have bony sarcomas like an osteosarcoma. Much less likely to be a liposarcoma, but it needs to be in our differential. We can also think of a thymolipoma, where we've got fatty tissue that is extending down into the anterior mediastinum from the thymus, and it's got islands of thymic tissue within it, and that can be surgically resected. We can also think of intrapulmonary lesions, like a hematoma. They also have fat in them, sometimes with some calcification, and if that hematoma has a lot of fat in it and it's abutting the heart, we can add that to our list of differentials. Okay, so we spent a bit of time on case one. Let's head on to case two, figure out where the lesion is, and then try and come up with a differential, and I'll see you all after the case. Okay, so welcome back. Let's get into case two. Now, whenever I look at a radiograph like this, it's good to take a step back and see what strikes you straight away. The first thing that strikes me when I look at an x-ray like this is that this child is ill. It's not a well child. They're intubated. There's a nasogastric tube. They've got electrodes on the chest. We're dealing with a sick child here. The second thing that strikes me is obviously this opacity in the right upper zone, and it looks like it's in the right upper lobe. We're bordered by the horizontal fissure, and we've lost that right paratracheal stripe here. So this opacity looks like it's occupying the right upper lobe. 
Now, when I see a pediatric x-ray with a pacification in the right upper lobe, we're trying to think, is this collapse in that lobe or is this consolidation? And perhaps in the back of our mind, is this a mass that's filling the space? But normally, we're differentiating between collapse and consolidation. Now, when we're looking for signs of collapse, we're looking for features of volume loss. And this x-ray has multiple features of volume loss. The first being that this right hemidiaphragm has been raised upwards here. We can see that the volume of this right hemithorax is way less than the volume of the left hemithorax. We've also got compensation by that left hemithorax. If you see the medial border of this left lung, look how it extends all the way across to the left-hand side here, crossing the midline. And we can see lung markings here behind the dome of that left hemidiaphragm. So this lung is extending all the way down like this. It's a massive left lung compensating for that volume loss on the right-hand side. We can also look at the trachea, and we can see the ET tube within the trachea, and it looks like the trachea here is deviated to the right. Now, whenever we're assessing tracheal deviation, we want to see if the film is rotated or not. The parallax, when we rotate, can look like the trachea is actually deviated when it's actually lying centrally. Now here's a tip in pediatric radiographs. In adults, we look at the medial borders of the clavicles. We look for the spinous process, and if the spinous process is midway between those clavicles, we can kind of safely say that this is not rotated. Now children are a bit more bendy. They're often held up in front of the detector, and we can't use the clavicles to accurately assess rotation. And also they very rarely have spinous processes for us to actually measure. Now, the way that I look for rotation in a pediatric radiograph, especially in a young child like this, is to look at the anterior ribs here. You see these anterior ribs coming forward. Now, we can measure that distance of that anterior rib and look on the contralateral side and look for the anterior rib here and see if these distances are roughly equal. If I was to hold my hands like this, these are the anterior ribs. As I rotate, these anterior ribs will get longer and these anterior ribs will get shorter if the x-ray beam is coming onto me like that. So the anterior ribs are a good assessment for rotation in a pediatric radiograph like this. This image, that distance of the anterior ribs looks equal on both sides. So this trachea has been deviated towards the side of the opacification. These are all signs of collapse and collapse in a small child we need to be thinking of, especially in an intubated small child, is this ET tube too far down? Has it occluded the right upper lobe bronchus? And in this case, it looks well positioned, the ET tube. We can see our right upper lobe bronchus here and our bronchus intermedius. The second thing is in these children, they get mucus plugging of that right upper lobe bronchus. It's the smallest caliber bronchus, often the first one to go, causing collapse in the right upper lobe. And also in small children, if they become very hyperinflated, that right upper lobe bronchus can kink and collapse the right upper lobe. So without doubt, in this case, there is some form of collapse. There is some atelectasis of this right upper lobe because we've got all these features of collapse. But when looking at this radiograph, we can't exclude consolidation, especially because of this sign that we can see in this right upper lobe. What we've got here is air bronchograms. We can see the bronchi, the segmental bronchi, within the mass here. We can clearly see bronchi with air in it, surrounded by alveoli with fluid and inflammatory cells in it. Now when we have a pneumonia, which this is a right upper lobe pneumonia, that fluid and the inflammatory cells can spread between all the alveoli through the pores of con and can fill this entire lobe. This is a low bar pneumonia. So here we've got a low bar pneumonia with some features of collapse, but it doesn't cross that horizontal fissure because there's no connection between this right upper lobe. There's no pause of con between the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, and right lower lobes. Now it's also important to remember that when we see a right upper lobe collapse and consolidation like this, our right lower lobe also extends all the way behind this right upper lobe. So if I was to take a CT slice across the patient at the level of, say, T4 here, we would see normal right lower lobe within that axial slice. Now I'm going to show you a CT scan from a different patient. This is an adult patient who also has a right upper lobe consolidation. And you can see clearly here how those air bronchograms are made. Fluid and inflammatory cells within the alveoli, the bronchi are spared, and we get that dense parenchyma next to a hollow viscous, so we get the air bronchogram forming. Now we can see a fissure separating this right upper lobe from the right lower lobe here. That right lower lobe, the lower lobes extend backwards all the way up to about the level of T3, T4 here. And we can see our right main bronchus here giving off the right upper lobe bronchus. 
our anterior segment, our posterior segment, and into the screen, an apical segment there. Now the reason I'm highlighting this right lower lobe being adjacent to the right upper lobe is that if we get a mass in this region here on a chest radiograph, that can look like a right upper lobe mass. It's always important to remember there is a lower lobe running behind that right upper lobe. So that's it for case two. Have a look at case three and join me afterwards. I'll see you there. Okay, so welcome back. I hope you're finding these cases useful. We're going to go through case three together now. Now, this is one of my favorite cases, and this is a case that will come up in your radiology training. It's something that you need to know, you need to recognize as soon as you see the radiograph. Now, here we've got a frontal chest radiograph in a skeletally mature individual, and our abnormality here is on the left-hand side. It's easy to see we've got this veiling of the left hemithorax. When a bride wears a veil, it hangs over like that, We've got opacity in the superior regions that gets more and more lucent as we head inferiorly on that left hemithorax. Now again here, we've got features of volume loss. Our trachea is deviated to the side of the veiling. It's deviated to the left. Our left hemidiaphragm is in fact higher than our right hemidiaphragm. Normally that right hemidiaphragm with the liver underneath it is higher than our left hemidiaphragm. Here we've got that left hemidiaphragm being drawn up and probably the right one being pushed down with some compensatory hyperinflation on the right. We've also lost the lingular border here. We can see how there's a well-defined left heart border and then we lose that left heart border in the region of the lingular. Our left hilum is difficult to see. We actually can't see our left main bronchus very well. It's been pulled up towards this opacity here. And perhaps most striking is this air that is surrounding the aorta as it heads down, the descending thoracic aorta. It caps the top of the aortic arch and then extends all the way down. And this is what's known as the Luftsickle sign. We can see this air that is surrounding our aorta and extending all the way down. Now the combination of these features, the volume loss on the left hand side, the Luftsickle sign, and the loss of that lingular border here, are all features of a left upper lobe collapse. Now importantly, a left upper lobe collapse isn't a diagnosis itself. Something is causing that collapse and that's what we need to investigate. And in an adult patient like this, we need to be suspicious of a non-benign lesion here compressing that left upper lobe bronchus, causing this left upper lobe collapse. And this patient will need cross-sectional imaging to investigate further. So if we have a look at a lateral of a left upper lobe collapse, this is actually a different case. We can see this horizontal fissure here with the collapse above it. This is the left upper lobe. And our left lower lobe has hyperexpanded all the way superiorly up here. And you can see why the aorta descending down is wrapped in air here. That left lower lobe has wrapped around the aorta, giving us that look sickle sign. Now, while we're looking at the lateral here, this is a really good case to differentiate the left and right hemidiaphragms. Now, it's not always going to be as easy as this. We can see here that our left hemidiaphragm has been pulled upwards. Normally on a lateral, that left is either adjacent or slightly below the right hemidiaphragm. And it's difficult to say which is the left and which is the right. So I'll show you a couple of tips to differentiate them. The first is that the stomach bubble sits below the left hemidiaphragm. So in this case, it's very easy to say that this is the left hemidiaphragm because here's our stomach bubble. If the diaphragms were the other way around, it becomes a little bit more difficult. The second thing is that the left hemidiaphragm extends towards the heart and about two-thirds of the way along we lose that left hemidiaphragm where the heart comes into contact with the left hemidiaphragm. We get loss of the silhouette of that left hemidiaphragm. The heart is on the left-hand side, it's resting on that dome. 
And the last thing we can look at is the ribs here. We get what's known as the big rib sign. A lateral radiograph is taken with the patient's left side on the detector, the x-rays coming from the right-hand side, and those x-rays diverge as they're heading towards the patient. Now, because our right ribs are closer to the x-ray source, they're going to cast a larger shadow. They're going to have more magnification. So these ribs coming out here are our right ribs, and these ribs on the other side are our left ribs. So the left hemidiaphragm is going to stop at the region of the left ribs, and our right hemidiaphragm is going to come all the way across to our right ribs. And those are the three ways we can differentiate left and right hemidiaphragms. So hopefully these tips are helping you. I hope you've learned something from this case. Now before we go on to case number four proper, I want to share with you a 4.1 case. One case that's going to lead on to the next case. So let's go over to 4.1. I'm not going to disappear. We're going to go through the case together. So have a look at this frontal chest radiograph, identify where you think the abnormality is, and then I'm going to show you a second radiograph of the same patient just 10 minutes later. So take a moment now, look at this radiograph, and I'm sure you're all looking at this opacity here in the left upper zone extending down towards the hilum here. Now 10 minutes later, this x-ray was repeated, and the repeat x-ray looked like this. Now you can see that opacity has completely disappeared. And this is what's known as the hair artifact sign. If I go back here, we can see that the patient's braids or plaits or whatever it is, I'm not a hair expert, but the patient's hair is coming down. Often we will see a hair tie with a little metallic part of the hair tie, which is a date giveaway that that's a hair artifact. Now this case serves as a reminder that not everything on a chest x-ray is actually within the thorax. You can have a breast lump that looks like a solitary pulmonary nodule. And if you're unsure, either you need to be repeating that x-ray or you need to be getting a second view. A frontal and a lateral will always help you to identify where exactly that lesion is located. So let's head on to case number four proper and I'll see you all in a minute's time. Okay, so let's get into the penultimate case, case 4.2. Again, we've got a frontal chest radiograph, no surprise. It's an AP erect radiograph, and we see these linear lines that trace the contours of the thorax, both on the right-hand side and actually two on the left-hand side. Now, when you first look at a radiograph like this, the first thing that comes to mind is this is a pneumothorax, our visceral pleura creating that line. We've got air between the chest wall and the lung itself. If we look closer here, we can see that they're actually lung markings that extend beyond these lines. And the lines themselves aren't actually thin lines like the visceral pleura. We've got some thickness to these lines, and the opacity goes from more dense to less dense as we head medially on those lines. Now this is a mimic of a pneumothorax, and hopefully I didn't give too much away in case 4.1 where we saw the hair artifact outside of the thorax. This is the same here. This is not within the chest wall. This is a skin fold. Now often you see skin folds in elderly patients who've got some loose skin. We've wedged the detector behind them, shifting some of their skin, making a fold where we've trapped some air between two pieces of skin. And what we get is this appearance of a skin fold. Now, they're not always this easy to tell apart between a pneumothorax and a skin fold, but some general rules. If there are lung markings that extend beyond the line, then we can fairly confidently say that it's not a pneumothorax. If the skin fold crosses the midline, then we can also say that's unlikely to be a pneumothorax. And if there's thickness to the line, that's one of the best differentiators. A thick line is likely to represent a skin fold. A thin line is much more likely to be a pneumothorax. Now, why did I say AP erect would become important? 
Well, normally when we take a chest radiograph, the detector is on the front side of the patient, the x-ray source is behind them, and we shoot those x-rays from posterior to anterior. The patient is hugging the detector like this, moving the scapulae away from the body, preventing the scapula from casting a shadow over the lung fields. Here we can see the scapula behind the lung fields. This patient has had an AP radiograph where the detector is behind them, and that detector has shifted their skin, giving these skin folds here, as well as the scapula not being outside the field of view. I'm going to show you a second case here, and I want to see if you can think if this is a pneumothorax or is this a skin fold. Have a look at the x-ray here. A little bit more difficult. The exposure is also a bit different in this x-ray. And this one's much harder. Now, if we look closely, we can see that this line is thick. It's not a thin line. It's difficult in an unsharpened image to see whether there are lung markings extending beyond. But in the sharpened image of this, you can subtly see some lung markings extending beyond the line. And if we look closely and follow this line all the way up, follow it across, we can see that the line actually crosses over the midline. There's a large flap of skin, a large skin fold, as that detector has been pushed behind the patient here. Now also when you look at an x-ray like this, this looks like some subcutaneous emphysema. It looks like air underneath the subcutaneous tissue here. Now this, this potential subcutaneous emphysema, with this skin fold and a pacemaker in the image, raises your index of suspicion that something has happened here, that the pneumothorax has been caused while putting the pacemaker in and there's some subcutaneous emphysema. But in fact, the fact that it's a thick line, it extends past the midline, this is just a skin fold. And I want to show you the CT of this patient and see how a skin fold can also give the appearance of subcutaneous emphysema. So let's go across to that CT now. So here's an axial CT of the thorax. We can see those pacemaker wires in our patient and the skin folds as well while that patient's sitting in the CT gantry. If I change our windowing here, we can see these skin folds better. You can see how this gives the appearance of a pneumothorax and as we scroll through the image, how this could look like subcutaneous emphysema on the patient's left-hand side here. So again, a skin fold is a mimic of a pneumothorax and it's another reminder that not everything we see in the chest is in fact within the rib cage. It can be within the soft tissue surrounding the patient. So let's move on to our final case. I will see you in 60 seconds time. So we've reached the end, let's go through our final case of the day. There's a lot going on in this chest radiograph. We can see, hopefully, you've noticed, this large cavitating mass within the right middle and right lower zones of this chest radiograph. And if you look closely, you can see something that looks very similar lying posterior to the heart here. This also has a thickened wall, it's got solid components and gaseous components. Now this patient actually has two separate pathologies. This patient is known with a large hiatus hernia. So this here represents a large hiatus hernia. And it would be strange if this was a pulmonary pathology, to be crossing the midline like that, sitting in that position, would be a strange place for a really large cavitating mass, sitting behind the heart and somehow getting to the right-hand side of the thorax. This, on the right-hand side, is a separate pathology. We've got thick walls here, regions of air, solid component to this mass. Now, if this mass was a complete circle, the frontal radiograph and the lateral radiograph, the shape of that mass would stay the same. The second option is that this mass is sitting underneath the pleura. Either it's sitting underneath this lateral pleura and extending out towards the lungs, we can't see any gap between the mass and the chest wall, 
or it's sitting underneath that posterior surface. And if it's underneath the pleura and it looks like a circle from front on, as we turn the radiograph to a lateral radiograph, we change the shape of this mass here. So the two things we're thinking of here in the sick patient is they've either got a lung abscess, which would be a rounded mass within the lung parenchyma, or they've got an empyema, where there's pus filling that extra pleural space. Now a clue here is that we've got these acute angles between the mass and the chest wall, which favors an intraparenchymal mass, which favors an abscess. Now in an abscess, we'd be getting air within this lesion because of the necrosis within that abscess. If it was an empyema and we've got air in the lesion, then we're likely dealing with a bronchopleural fistula, where that empyema has eroded into a bronchus and we've got air filling that pleural space. Now I promise you that I would try and fit some form of interventional radiology into here. So here is the slide just for all you aspiring interventional radiologists. We've got a CT scan here. We can see we have a CT guided drainage of this pulmonary abscess. If we get our bearings here, here is the posterior portion of the patient. There's a vertebral body, the large hiatus hernia here, the heart sitting in front of that hiatus hernia, and we can see our needle coming in to drain this abscess here. And we can see that this abscess is making an acute angle with the pleura. So it's likely that it is growing within the lungs. A mass that's growing from the pleura, we normally get an obtuse angle. We have what almost looks like a dural tail when we look at a meningioma in the brain. The meningioma is an extra axial mass. Here, if we had an empyema, we would have an extra pulmonary mass pulling in. We would have that obtuse angle instead of an acute angle like this. Now, in contrast to CT scans, we can normally see around an abscess an enhancing wall. And in an empyema, we get a split pleura sign where we get a bright parietal pleura and a bright visceral pleura surrounding that empyema. Now, empyema is generally a lens or a curve shape. Our abscesses are generally round, but often they're quite difficult to tell apart. Now, we can see this patient's x-ray after they've had that drainage. We've got resolution of that right lung abscess, and we've still got this large hiatus hernia that's remaining here. So hopefully you've learned something from these five cases. I've really enjoyed sharing them with you. And I want to thank RISE for inviting me to share this workshop. And thank you for spending your time going through these cases with me. And I'd love to have some feedback from you. So you can contact me on Radiology Tutorials on YouTube, also Radiology Tutorials on Instagram, or Radiology Tuts on Twitter. And if you need any help in the future when you're going through your radiology training, you can always DM me. I'm happy to chat there. So enjoy the other workshops within the conference. Spend the time getting to know your colleagues, your future colleagues in the radiology field. You've made a great choice choosing radiology. And until next time, goodbye, everybody.